Access to Democracy is made possible by donations from the following organizations. Thomson Reuters, a global company with expertise and insight to unravel complex situations in the areas of law, tax, compliance, government, and media. Their worldwide network of journalists and editors keep customers up to speed on relevant global events. Thomson Reuters, The Answer Company. The division championship Minnesota Twins are looking to go all the way to the World Series in 2024. Bolstered by inspirational shortstop Carlos Correa, a healthy Brian Buxton, and rookie phenom Royce Lewis, plus a pitching staff led by Pablo Lopez and an outstanding bullpen featuring Johan Duran, the Twins are the best bargain in the major leagues, and Target Field is the best venue in baseball. Sheridan Dulas and Kins, PA, a family and criminal defense law firm, has been serving clients in Dakota County and throughout Minnesota for over 40 years. Ranked a tier one best law firm by US News and World Report every year since 2009, Sheridan Dulas and Kins are here to help you in your most difficult life circumstances. Established in 2007, 45th Parallel Spirits was among the first 50 micro distilleries in the United States. Based in New Richmond, Wisconsin, all aspects of production occur at our facility. If you're interested in visiting and learning more about the 45th Parallel Distillery, please check our website and plan a visit to tour our facility and taste our spirits. Truestone Financial, with locations in Minnesota and Wisconsin, has proudly served as members since 1939. Truestone engages, educates, and supports its members to ensure they have the tools to empower their financial well-being. Truestone Financial, your neighborhood credit union. Learn more at truestone.org. Hello and welcome to Access to Democracy. I'm your host today, Steve Francisco. Thank you for joining us for this episode. It's my pleasure to welcome to our set today, Holly Jenkins, who is also an occasional guest host for a new segment on international travel that we actually debuted earlier this year. And in the future, she'll be sitting where I'm sitting and she'll have other guests to talk about travel experiences. So. Holly, welcome to the show. Well, thank you. It is always such a pleasure to be here, and I'm very excited about the new segment. We're happy to have you coming travel. back into our rotation of occasionally hosting our shows. Thank and you. I, I think it's an exciting topic because I know myself, my wife and I love traveling. We're, in fact, we're getting ready, as you know, to go on a big trip ourselves, yes. our second big trip this year. But I think a lot of people that I talk to are very interested in travel. Mm -hmm. And um, they may be surprised that in some cases it's more affordable than they actually think it is. And there are That's strategies true. for ways that they can reduce the cost of trips too. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Absolutely. But I thought I wanted to ask you, tell us about your employer. You work at Carousel Travel. Tell yes. us about Carousel. So Carousel Travel is an independently owned travel agency, full service. We do anything from individual family planning, people who are going with couples or uh, larger family groups um, to we host large tours that go to different destinations, business incentive travel, corporate travel. So you name it, we can cover it. Mm -hmm. um, we're located out in Richfield and probably one of the largest, most successful privately held travel agencies in the Midwest. And I actually was driving down Lindale Avenue not long ago and I looked and saw the sign Carousel Travel that's, and I thought of you. I thought where that's where me. Holly works at. Yes, yes, it's a, we were just ranked again for the 10th tenth, tenth year in a row, one of the best places to work according to Minneapolis St. Paul Business Magazine. So it's not only a um, place that is full of people who are very enthusiastic and passionate about travel, and assuring other people have a wonderful travel experience, but it's it's great camaraderie within the company itself. So I, I feel lucky to be there. How many people work there, Holly? There are know? about 40 full-time employees, mm -hmm. um, m most of whom work remote or partially remote, and that was partly due to COVID. Mm -hmm. um, so we can talk a little bit about that. But, um, but yeah, there's about 40 people, and we were all in the office this week for a annual training time and had a lot of fun and right. talked about all of our travel. Experiences. So certainly one of the biggest events of our lifetimes, uh, and it's really not that far in the rearview mirror, was the COVID pandemic, mm -hmm. which uh, caused so much dislocation and disruption, but particularly in the travel industry. We saw thousands of people lose their jobs in hospitality, 
uh, people who worked in the airline industry, the cruise ship industry, because travel, pretty much uh, a lot of it was suspended or canceled during the period of COVID. So one of my questions for you, Holly, I think some of our viewers might be wondering, are you aware, are there any countries that still have COVID restrictions in place or vaccination requirements in place to be able to visit there? Nothing that I'm aware of due to COVID. Mm -hmm. um, there may be other conditions that you have to show proof of vaccination, but at this point, the places that we travel to have not required proof of vaccination um, or any proof of a negative COVID test or anything like that. We still put it on as a, this could change at any time right. warning before people go on trips. But at this point, um, from a health perspective, COVID is not an issue for traveling. And one of the things that I've been made aware of reading online, travelers have to be very aware of what the requirements are of foreign countries to be able to visit there, correct? Absolutely. So, you know, you may not be able to go on that cruise to a foreign country if you don't have the proper visas. You certainly need to have a valid U.S. passport. Mm -hmm. And they also require that passports be valid six months beyond the printed expiration date Correct. in the passport, right? Yes, yes. Most countries, they might have some that are less than that, but we would always recommend a six-month window uh, beyond, your expert, beyond your departure date from the country. Why it's that long is a question we all ask a little bit about, but it's partly just in case you get delayed, they don't want you to be stuck there. Right. Um, and for U.S. travelers, passports are typically the only thing. They do want you to bring your actual passport book. You can't bring a photo of it. You can't bring a passport card for anything other than Canada travel, uh, Mexico too. So you need that, that book. And it does take, it can take quite a while to renew your passport. So if you have a trip coming up in the next year, just be sure you look at your at your expiration date and make right. sure that it is well ahead of six months beyond, beyond the expiration the, date yes so for example if someone is contemplating a trip to let's say europe next summer they want to go to uh, the united kingdom or to france mm -hmm. they should be looking at renewing that passport now if it's going to expire within six months of the date of travel for next correct year. and it's and it has to do with the date of when you are, when you're, say that your trip is going to end on August 30th right. of 2025, that means what would six months be? February of 2026. If your passport expires before that six month window, you need to get it renewed and start early because it'll save you some money. Right. There's also other ways that make it a little bit easier to travel. Um, if you are going to do more than one international trip in a year, it's nice to have a global entry card. I don't know if you and your wife have one of these yet, but it allows you when you're coming back into the country to bypass some of the long lines that you can see in customs. Right. Um, you can get caught up in customs line for quite a while, but if you invest in a global entry, I believe it's a five-year pass, um, might be a worthy investment for you. And time. we should tell people too, the global entry pass that you're talking about, that's for international travel, right? That's different from the TSA pre-check. Yes. yes, this is for when you return to the United States. From you, a foreign country. From a foreign country, right. you will have to go through customs where you return. And I've come back into Minneapolis, St. Paul, and myself and about five other international flights. And all of a sudden you have hundreds of people in line ready to go through customs. And, it, and when you've are just getting back from an international and flight. You're tired, you can be tired. You're exhausted. You just want to get through customs and yep. get home and go to bed. So just give that some thought. If you're going to start doing some international travel, it might be a worthy investment. Right. Um, so like, as a travel agent, what do you see as a few of the hottest international destinations that you are booking right now for mm -hmm. clients? What places are people in, interested in going to? Right. You know, I think we're still seeing, um, to be honest, Europe and the Scandinavian countries are probably still some of the people that, if you haven't been there, that is at the top of your list in, in a lot of cases. Scandinavian countries, Norway, without a doubt. Iceland is another one that a lot of people are traveling to. Ireland. But now we're also starting to see more of a trend towards South American countries. So I think more people are interested in Argentina, um, Uruguay, uh, Costa Rica, these types of places. So we're moving maybe a little bit away from the European um, circle and heading south a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I've heard discussion on some travel shows that I've seen on YouTube and uh, on television, people talking about more what they're calling ecotourism. Absolutely. Um, and also philanthropy travel, where you're not just going to a place, let's say, to lay on the beach, but you're actually 
getting connected to perhaps a nonprofit organization that is doing humanitarian work or environmental work mm -hmm. in a place that you may be visiting. Say a word about that. Well, and I think just to back to your point about some of these opportunities can be less expensive, and that's one really nice way to get to some pretty incredible destinations, feel very good about what you're doing, and typically they come at a much lower cost than just the type of vacation that you go on to lay on a beach. Right, and um, it doesn't mean necessarily that that's all you're doing, correct. that you have maybe one day that you can allocate. I think you can determine how much time you allocate out of your vacation to yes. do something that's sort of a way of giving back to the place that you're visiting. Mm -hmm. I wish I, I don't have any examples of, I'm trying to think of some of the um, more popular ecotourism sites. I haven't worked with those for a while. I know they exist and they are very popular. People who have done them just mm -hmm. continue to travel that way. Mm -hmm. There's so many different ways to travel and that's definitely one of them. And it just, again, gives you a, a worthy that you've done something to improve the place that you went to visit. And like everything else, there's probably information, I'm assuming, on the internet, social oh, media about opportunities for that type of travel, in addition to working with travel agencies. Yes, yeah, so you could also call Carousel Travel and we'll get you lined up with anybody who... I was anybody just who... thinking that very, that <laughs> yeah, very thought. Because that is one of the things we might not personally host an uh, ecotourism trip, but we can always line people up and right. find the right fit for um, whatever your interest right. is or wherever you'd like to go. So let's talk about your personal travel this year. You've had a busy year, actually a busy two years, but I mm -hmm. want to zero in specifically on two trips you took this year in May. Mm -hmm. um, I know that you were in the Faroe Islands. Yes. And the first thing that I suspect a lot of people might be wondering, where are the Faroe Islands? Yes. It's um. A lot of people ask me that, and they, it, it was always a double take. Where are you going? And spell, and, it's spelled F-A-R-O-E. -E. Yes. Faroe Islands. Faroe Islands is, um, this is a trip that I did solo, so I went on my own, and it was quite an adventure just getting there. Um, the Faroe Islands is located, you'll see in this picture, um, it is right in the middle of the North Atlantic. It's an archipelago of 18, I believe it's about 18 islands make up the Faroe Islands altogether. Um, you fly into Reykjavik, and then you hop on another little propeller-type plane, and you fly that last hour onto, onto the Faroe Islands. So there's no jumbo jet service from the U.S. direct to the Faroe Islands. You have to no. go through Scotland, I would guess. The, the, I went through Iceland, but or I will Iceland, tell you, yeah. while I was there, there were plenty of people from Northern Europe that travel there. Um, those are the countries that they see visitors coming from. I think I ran into one other American couple who was there in May. Really, I was wow. very surprised. So I, it was it was a spectacular place. Um, the people were inc so welcoming and warm and friendly. They did not speak very good English, so be prepared for that when you go. But you are going to enter into a world of um, scen scenery that you've just never seen anywhere else. In fact, uh, part of the Faroe Islands that you can see in this picture here that I brought was the scene of a um, James Bond movie. And it was an island that the evil character lived at. And uh, this, is, this is how remote these places look. It doesn't feel like you're anywhere else that you've seen on Earth. Hmm. Um, very uh, unique weather conditions as well. They have a fair amount of um, rain and wind and fog. I was extremely fortunate to be there in May and of the I was only there for six days but four of the six days were sunny. So maybe late spring or early summer if someone's thinking about going there that might be a good time to think about. It worked out for me. but Probably the, don't want to go there I'm guessing in November, December, or January. If you want to see some pretty incredible weather conditions I think January, February would be just phenomenal but mm. I think there's some better places to go. Um, one thing I will say too about the Faroe Islands, the, it's a land that has more sheep than, than it does people. So you can see in this picture, there's just lamb and sheep everywhere you go. And you just constantly hear that ringing of the ba ba. And by the time I left there, I was so used to hearing that wherever I went, that it was a little bit um, disheartening to come home and, and not hear the sheep. My wife and I, I had know. the privilege of traveling a few years back to Scotland. We spent a week in Scotland. We were in Inverness and by Loch Ness mm. and Edinburgh, and it was really a fabulous trip. But I remember hearing that in Scotland, too, that there were actually more sheep mm -hmm. in Scotland than there are people. Yes, yeah. yes. And the, the, they have two main towns in the Faroe Islands. The, their largest town, I think there's, in the entire camp, the entire consistency of the 18 islands, there's maybe 50,000 people total. 
that live there. So smaller than Egan, which is where I that's live here. That's fewer people than live in St. Cloud. Yes, and that's, yeah. that's what makes up this entire country. Um, you have the major, the capital is Torshan, and I believe that's about 20,000 people that live there. You wouldn't know it walking around there. It's very easy to get around these islands. They've made it um, quite friendly to uh, travelers, to visitors, and I would again point that out as a benefit to getting there sooner than later because as more people learn how easy they've made it to travel through these islands, um, I think you're going to start seeing more and more tourism pick up there. Interesting, but your key point might be you're not going to see the crowds in the Faroe mm -hmm. Islands that you would see in London. Correct. Even in the biggest city, you right. you can feel very, um, it, it feels like you're just in a small little town. And you feel like you're in a safe place. A very, it, You feel friendly. very safe throughout. Um, I, again, being a solo female traveler, I never once felt any sense of concern. Um, I'm always careful when I do my solo trips. Mm -hmm. um, you always have to be aware of your surroundings, but this was a remarkable place with some pretty incredible stories. Their background in um, with the Viking and medieval ages is pretty phenomenal to get to those museums wow. and see, see what has been there, and it hasn't changed a whole lot. That's what's interesting. So your experience, I suspect, may have piqued some people's interest in possibly considering a visit maybe to I, the Faroe Islands. I hope so, and I will say this too. I was able to rent a car, and for a full week I went through one tank of gas. That was it. It's very compact. They have tunnels, six-mile-long tunnels, and they're a little sketchy, scary. They're narrow, but you get underneath the waterways in a tunnel to get to the mm -hmm. next island or through a mountain. So it's a phenomenal place, and I would encourage anybody um, to, to spend a week there if you can. So let's have a change of location here. In June this year, you had a really wonderful trip to Italy. Mm -hmm. You and I talked about this. I believe uh, you posted pictures on Facebook. I was following you on Facebook, yes. and we talked about your trip when you got back. Um, tell us about that trip. What did you see? Where did you go on that Absolutely. trip? Absolutely. I will say this. So I, I was in the Faroe Islands, the land of no people, with sheep one week, and the week later I was in Rome. And it was the most <laughs> most interesting Talk um, about a culture com comparison shock, because right? Rome is packed. So we flew into Rome, and we spent um, two nights there and three days, basically, mm -hmm. um, scouring uh, the sites of Rome. So Had we you were been able, there before? I had not been there before. Oh. I would say so many highlights from this trip, I don't even know where to begin, but one of the things I wanna just share this picture that I took of the Colosseum. Mm -hmm. um, being at the Colosseum, you see pictures of it all the time, but standing next to it is just pretty awe-inspiring. It's amazing, and then if you get, if you're lucky enough to visit and get inside, which I know you have been there. Right. Um, another photo I have shows the inside, it's just, mind-boggling and you must have felt I assume the same that how did they build this right so long ago without modern anything that we have today um, it's, it's quite overwhelming because there's so much history you think you are walking the streets that people like uh, Julius Caesar yeah. and Augustus and uh, mm -hmm. uh, the Roman emperors and Roman senators walked a couple of thousand right. years ago or more. Well, and one thing I didn't realize is that the, the Colosseum is right next to the Roman Forum, right. which is where all of these government buildings were, and just exactly that. That's where these people actually stood, and it's the original, right. original items there. Now, when you go, you are not the only person there. So <laughs> be prepared. I think this was one of the... I don't want to call it the most unexpected, but um, I, I don't think even I was prepared for the crowds. Mm -hmm. It is a very crowded Especially city. that time of year. That time of year. Right. We were there the first week of June. Um, there might be other times to go, but to go to the Colosseum, the Roman Forum, walking around, just Rome mm -hmm. in general, um, the eating was phenomenal. The restaurants, you just can't go wrong with pizzas. That's one and, of my favorite things about yeah. Italy. Um, I know we're going to talk about a couple of the other cities yeah. you visited too, but I have to tell a real quick story. My wife and I, some years back, we were in Florence, mm -hmm. Firenze, and one night we weren't quite sure where we wanted to go to dinner, so we hopped in a cab at our hotel, and I turned to the cab driver and I said to him, take us to your favorite restaurant. Where would you go with friends or family to celebrate? And he took us off the beaten path about a 10, 15 minute drive from the center of Florence into a neighborhood. 
It was all Italian people, no other tourists. There was a line out the door of the restaurant. He knew the owner. <laughs> Next thing he knew, we knew, he was setting up a table by the doorway, brought a complimentary bottle of the house red wine, brought us an appetizer. We had the best meal Aww. of our time in Italy was in Florence. That was just that unforgettable. Wonderful. Those are the kind of experiences I think that people hope to get out of their international travel. Mm -hmm. Well, and I love that you brought that up because I think one of the key things, and I did this both in the Faroe Islands, I was in Nova Scotia recently as well, and um, that was one of the first things I did was just ask the local, the people who live there, where would you, where would you recommend? And right. Not to change the subject away from Rome, but um, one of the best places I found in Nova Scotia, I never would have found it by myself. Right. It was due to the locals, so always want to... And don't you find, Holly, that local people, they're so proud of their town, they're so proud of their countries, they want to show you, yeah. they want to tell you about the good places to I, go. I completely agree that um, I think it makes them feel good and it helps them welcome travelers right. um, more than they might otherwise if you were just um, coming into their space and... We could talk a little bit about that because there is, you know, some concern over tourism. So we can talk about that a little bit later as we get yeah. through. Let's hit real other quickly. Trips. What other places did you see in Italy? We went um, from Rome. We actually, this was a cruise. Now I went on my first ah. cruise, and I have never thought of myself as a cruiser. They call themselves. Right. Um, but I will say that after this experience, I would add cruising to anybody's repertoire over the course of the year. It's not that you have to do it every time, but it was a, an amazing way to see beautiful places such as Cinque Terre. Um, we were in Naples and that brought me to Pompeii. We were mm. in Florence. We went to Cannes and that brought me up into another historic region that's within a half hour drive of Cannes, but you would never know that it exists. It was the villages of Luberon and it was mm. spectacular. Um, we went to Provence, and so I got to Southern see the France. leather. Yes, right. we were in the French Riviera, so I got to see some of the um, the lavender fields. And again, oh. you just can't believe mm. that this is so close to the busy, populated areas. But it was by being on a cruise, I was able to get to all these places right. without ever having to pack up and check out of a hotel. Did, and that's the <laughs> nice thing about cruising. We did our first ocean cruise. Uh, last year, two years ago rather, to South America. We were in Peru and worked our way up through the Panama Canal, visited several places in Central America before cruising back to Miami. Mm -hmm. And it was wonderful. They take your luggage, they deliver it to your yeah. suite. You don't have to worry about transferring the bags or lugging bags around the ship. There was entertainment on our mm -hmm. ship. The food was fantastic. Yeah. On our particular ship on Oceana, they had five different restaurants. Yes. And, yeah. you know, so there are lots of different cruise ship companies. So, again, people should do their homework and research that. And right. working with a travel agent who has experience would definitely be to their advantage. It makes it a little bit easier when you have somebody kind of helping with all the logistics. Right. Um, so, again, I, you know, I just, I, I was... Not sure that I was going to enjoy a cruise, but I think the convenience of everything that they offered and the amount of sights and scenery that you get to take in right. is pretty spectacular. I just want to share one thing, and this was near Cannes, um, which is where the big film festival is that right. most people would know about. But this was one of the most well-kept um, medieval villages. And we were a half hour outside of this incredibly hustle and bustle mm -hmm. world of the city, and just this quick little bus ride away, and we were in, it took us back a thousand years. It was beautiful. Do you and remember the name of it? I have it written down. Yes, it was St. Paul de Vence. Oh. St. Paul de Vence. And so put that also on your, if right. you're ever in the south of France, that was a worthy stop with restaurants, ice cream shops. Boy, ice cream shops in Europe are incredible. Um, you had me hooked on ice cream. Yes. <laughs> we were in southern France. We were in Nice two years yeah. ago, and we went to a medieval village called Eza, and they actually had a, a we toured a perfumery where they actually develop and manufacture perfume and lotions there. Yes. And it was what an experience on a beautiful day. The sky was bright blue, mm -hmm. the Mediterranean Ocean was sparkling, and it was just fantastic. Yeah. And we also saw Monaco and saw a lot of the super yachts of 
some of the super wealthy. Just beautiful. We did have, while we were on one of these trips, we did have the luxury of going to a lavender perfume factory. Nice. And so a similar experience to see that kind of lavender, and I, I brought back some of the lavender essence that I can just nice. throw behind my ears. So, <laughs> Holly, there is some advice. Uh, what is some advice that you might give travelers planning a trip? Uh, we talked earlier about they should book as early as they can. And one of the reasons is you save money generally on airfare the earlier you book, correct? Because if you book closer to the date of travel, the lowest fares may not be available. That can be. So uh, uh, booking early is important partly because these destinations are filling up so mm -hmm. quickly. We have a trip planned, a big group going to Athens and on a Greek Isles cruise. Um, that sold out within a week. Mm. Not a week, a month, get me sorry. It sold out within a month. So we have over 240 people going and it just filled up so quickly and I'm still getting calls to go. The trip's not until next May. So plan um, ahead. Plan ahead. ahead, know that you're going ahead. The airfare, you never know what the airlines are going to do, but once they start filling up, yes, they can start increase, They start raising the prices. And we should remind people, once you lock in and confirm your airfare, you are locked in. Yes. The fares can go up after that, but not for you if you purchase your ticket. Right. Whereas if you haven't confirmed, but you're still contemplating, they can raise the airfare between the time you initially look at the trip and then when you actually confirm it. And that's interesting you brought that up because um, I, what I do at Carousel is I work in the group department, mm -hmm. and so I do group air t ticketing. And people will say, well, I just, you know, our, here's our price that we're offering for this trip. This is the, what we contracted at, and somebody will call and say, but it's either cheaper or less. Right. We are set here. This is what we've contracted, and that's why, yes, the, the pricing can go up and down, um, but you don't have to worry about whether your fare is gonna, it helps you budget. It right, helps you budget right. better once you have that locked in. And we should tell people too, when we talk about the expense, obviously things like airfare and hotel are some of the biggest expenses. Obviously you're gonna to have to eat while you're there, but sometimes you can find package vacation deals that can actually result in a lower price for your trip rather than booking each element separately. Absolutely. Um, say a word about airline affinity credit cards. Like I have a Delta uh, American Express card, mm -hmm. a gold card, that allows us to earn miles. Isn't that a good way to help reduce costs of your trip? Because you hit a mileage threshold and you might be able to get a free ticket or an upgrade? You definitely can do that. If you're, if you're earning your miles using either a credit card, when you are traveling, you can't use your American Express because not everyone will take Takes that. It, right. But once you're here using it, you can build up mileage. And um, even if you use part of your mileage to upgrade your seats and part cash, you always have that option. And there are different airlines. Pretty much every airline offers their own brand of credit card, which for mm -hmm. every dollar you spend, you earn a mile toward, or sometimes more than one mile toward travel. Yeah. But you can also get discounts uh, on hotels. You can also use miles you accumulate to pay for the cost of hotels, sometimes even tours. Yeah, I would say it's almost it's almost worth um, sticking with a certain brand just for that reason. Because if you stay with this particular brand of hotels, it doesn't take too long to earn some free extra nights there. Um, the perks for airlines, same similar thing. Once you're a loyal customer, you will start to see the benefits come back to you down the road. Wow. Um, but that's again for people who are traveling a little bit more. We hope everyone does. It's it's an exciting, it's an exciting part of life to get out and see these other the way people live. It's, it's and it's phenomenal. such an enriching experience. Travel is. I know that now that my wife and I are retired, we just love to travel, yeah. and we have two trips coming up. But Holly Jenkins from Carousel <laughs> Travel and an occasional host on Access to Democracy. Yes. Thank you for being our guest no. today. Thank you for telling our viewers about the Faroe Islands and about your adventures in Italy. And yes. hopefully they'll be inspired to uh, consider their own future travel plans. I sure hope so. I don't think that we can get enough travel in, in a lifetime. I would agree. All right. Thank, Thank you, you for Holly. having me. Thank you. It's great.